Welcome to Mud 79. I'm Fearless Fred Kennedy, the creator of this totally original and in no way authorized Star Wars fan fiction podcast. If you're listening to this, you probably love Star Wars. I do too, and have always dreamed about telling my own story in a galaxy far, far away. A story that's less about the Jedi Temple and more about those who were on the front lines. A boots on the ground story about how those living in the galaxy survive the horrors of war. That's what Mud 79 is all about. If you're new to the show, welcome, but please be aware this is a series. So if you don't want to be totally lost, start from the beginning with episode one. You don't want to be a stormtrooper. This is episode 23, Dog and Mutter Show. With only a few days remaining until the start of the Terracassi tournament in Floon Bay, the 79th embark on a training mission in the caves beneath the western mountain ridges of Seston 4. They're told the next phase of the war will be fought below the surface. Before their first major engagement, the 20th Company's fight team heads off to meet the rest of the Legion. And Solomon prepares to receive his Order of Palpatine Medal. With the entire 934th Legion focused on the tournament at Floon Bay, will the Seshers launch a surprise attack? Will their subterranean combat training be put to good use? And what awaits Kwai as he's separated from his fellow mutters? Let's find out. I was taking a good look at the health of the plants when my ride pulled up behind me. Corporal Kwai? I stood up and turned, the stick hanging from the corner of my mouth, a long ash falling onto my chest. A blue Twi'lek female stepped off the shuttle and came towards me. She had that white tunic that always came with bad news, intelligence, and she was a captain. I'm Captain Kunamini with Imperial Intelligence, Communications Wing. I'll be your go-to for the week. If you could just come with me, please. She seemed nice, in the sense that she was trying to be nice. I knew how the white tunics worked. They were listening to everything you said, taking notes, war listening devices, all of it. You always needed to watch yourself around these types. We got on board the speeder and spun round, heading towards the central admin building. This was, and I am not exaggerating at all, the nicest vehicle I had ever been in. Serif class, but a newer model. Fully enclosed, environmental controls, pristine interior. The driver even offered me a drink when I got in. There's a small refrigeration unit in front of you, Corporal. Inside, you'll find a selection of juices and a few other synthetically flavored beverages. If you're thirsty, just grab one, all right? Okay. I know all of this is new to you, Kwai. It's Solomon, right? Can I call you that? I nodded. This may seem a bit overwhelming, but there is no need to worry. Just stick with me, do as I tell you. You'll walk away from this experience with a data pad of contacts that will get you any post you want once the Seston campaign is concluded. She had this constructed smile, like she was speaking in code, and I was supposed to know what she meant. I muttered, sure, just tell me what to do, Captain. The buckets at the central admin building waved us through what I thought was a cargo entrance, but was actually a private entrance for the more important types who liked to keep their presence a secret. We pulled into an enclosed lot with a bunch of other serifs and high-end speeders, all of them glistening with a dark paint job, polished. There were some sabers in there too, sleek and mean, troopers all over, both mutters and buckets. Captain Minnie led me down a hallway and we entered a room with a long polished table and what I assumed was the entire command staff were seated around the other side. Over a dozen officers, the lowest being a high colonel. 
And at the far end, General Vasek, the CNC of the 934th Legion. But it got worse. Right next to him was Commodore Mel Dean, the cyborg. He got up, adjusted his tunic, and came right for me. His stride was sharp. There was something about this guy that just put me out of sorts. Similar to the Inquisitor, but much less intense. It was more primitive. This guy was violence. She was terror. Corporal Kawhi, it is a pleasure to meet you, young man. He grabbed my hand and shook it. A single shake looked at me the way my limmy coach did when I'd score a goal. A direct gleam of pride, draped in ownership. I've seen the holes. Your performance during that attack. Everything we hope to see in our soldiers. The room was quiet. Everyone was looking, even the buckets in the corners. He held them like he held me. His smile faded and he lowered his head a bit, staring at me directly. Scrambling across a frozen river, rallying your comrades, who were a bunch of fresh grey recruits and administrative staff who hadn't shot a blaster since basic training. Even after they'd all been killed. And you laid there in the mud, shivering, just hoping against hope you'd get out of there alive. You still reached for your rifle when you thought you had a line on one of those Sesher bastards. I saw it, my boy. I loved it. We all loved it. Here, here. I was starstruck. I was. This guy had been sent from the inner systems, and here he was praising me. It's hard not to get taken in by people like that, especially when you're young and when you've already seen them be as ruthless as ruthless gets. A commissary tray came in, served us all lunch, which was a collection of these really small sandwiches and one of the best cups of bean coffee I have ever had. The mood was light and everyone was joking around. I didn't really notice the hollow recorders in the room until my second cup of coffee. They explained to me I'd be making the rounds, meeting kids, playing Limmy with a youth team. They knew my childhood Limmy career, games I'd played, everything. They wanted me to speak with some fresh recruits and even pay a visit to a school and ensure the youth knew how important military service was. For the Empire! I was getting a very clear sense that I was a propaganda piece. But I didn't mind one bit. Sleazy as it feels looking back, no one was shooting at me for a few days. And that's all I could really hope for. When I woke up that morning, I was bunked on the top of a hill in a stinking jungle crawling with Seshers who wanted me dead. Now I was eating goofy little sandwiches and getting my head patted by officers who could change my entire life with a wave of their finger. It was surreal and I loved it. I really did. How could you not? Captain Minnie had shifted over behind the general and whispered in his ear, which got the attention of the Commodore who nodded without looking up. Solomon, I hope you've had your fill. But we've got some students who will be eagerly awaiting your appearance in their school auditorium. The command staff, most of whom had yet to even give me their name, stood up. I scrambled to my feet too, popping the last wad of bread and cheese into my mouth. Then the Commodore spoke. It was a pleasure to meet you, Cop. We'll be seeing you again, though, at the dinner tomorrow night following the fights. Just make sure the captain here doesn't run you ragged, of course. Wouldn't think of it, sir. <laughs> the room chuckled, a stale laughter that sounded the opposite of every barracks building I'd ever slept in. But we were off, not a second wasted. Didn't even get to take my coffee with me. Minnie led me down a series of hallways, deeper into the belly of the beast. Before we get to the school, you're to change into your new uniform. 
It's been tailored just for you. You'll also have 20 minutes to clean up before your hair is trimmed. We entered a change room, a locker room with showers and sinks. I was totally lost by this point. Scrub yourself down, Corporal. Let's stay on schedule. I'll be in the next room. Just follow me when you're ready. Leave your old clothes hanging in the locker where you'll find a bathrobe. That's all you'll need. Clock's ticking, Corporal. Get moving. She kept going through another set of doors on the opposite end of the room. I caught a flash of a few more bodies, all stewards. I just did what I was told. Showered, threw on the robe, and left my kit in a locker. I wanted those boots back, though. They had new insoles and were at the perfect level of broken in. I joined the captain in the next room, and she wasn't lying about the tailored uniform. It was perfect. I looked good in it. Really accentuated my shoulders, which I took a lot of pride in when I was that age. I expected a work dress uniform, but these were combats, fatigues. They had these brand new shin guards fresh off the line and a chest plate that was so shiny I could see my reflection. And the haircut? I looked great. After that, we were off back to the auto pool where we came in and moved out. We were heading towards a school in the city proper, one that had been set up for the influx of refugees fleeing the rising conflict in the east. Floon Bay was a contrast of architecture. There were a lot of taller, older buildings, Twilic made, ones that had been there for decades probably. Then there were newer buildings, had the fresh drab look of imperial architecture. There were some massive infrastructure projects going on too. Huge parks and land cultivation, a new series of canals, and a few residential towers that had begun construction. A lot of activity. But we pulled northwest and headed to an expanse of prefab buildings. The type of thing you'd expect to see when a legion was on the move. Housing for a few thousand people, lined in rows. Not a lot of people around, but it was clean and neat. The driver said this was where they put the refugees. The residential towers going up were being made specifically for them. And most of them were hands with the construction crews, either on the towers or in the other projects. Their kids were all in a massive educational facility run by the army where they were given aptitude testing and an education designed to suit their specific needs, meaning channeling them into a trade that the Imperial military was in need of at the time. Advance. The school was a hybrid of building materials and was still under work. There was scaffolding up, tarped over building materials, prefab elements and bags of raw crete. Recreational facilities too, if you can call them that. A training course, obstacles, a firing range, generic all-purpose sports field. There were kids out there playing on them too, wearing school-issued rec gear, kicking a ball around. I was immediately led onto the field to give them a lesson in Limmy. The rules, all that stuff, hollow recorders buzzing around, taking everything in. The second I was done, they had a rough game going and I was dragged off again by Minnie. I was needed inside to speak to more kids. I didn't even know what was going on. I wound up giving a lecture to near the whole school. A few hundred kids gathered in the gym, all age ranges, anywhere from six to their late teens. They had a hollow projector showing various places I'd been, battles, some of it pretty graphic looking, stills of bodies being shot. They had a recreation of the assault at Domju, the chaos of that underground explosion, soldiers being buried alive, and these kids were just watching it all. Then their principal, who was an army captain, asked me some questions. He was leading me though, answering them for me without really giving me a chance to change the direction of anything being said. I was almost just agreeing with him the whole time, elaborating as best I could, adding the color of first-hand experience, 
how my comrades, my fellow mutters, and the bond that we shared are what get you through these types of situations. That it can be terrifying, but knowing you're all in it together is what matters. I would look over at the kids, their faces, and how they were these fresh little balls of clay, and I was beating them over the head like we did with the FNGs. That always seemed okay, though. The FNGs had asked to be there, but these were kids. Maybe the FNGs didn't want to be there either. Were they coerced because some dipshit rolled into their classroom in brand new fatigues and gave them a hype job like I was doing? It just felt dirty. I felt dirty. And the whole time I could see Captain Minnie in my peripheral focused on me, taking notes, which was followed by kids asking questions. They had to be planted or guided because all of them sounded so staged. Can I enlist right now? That kid was maybe nine or ten. You need to be dumber than an inbred Gamorrean to fall for something this obvious. We wrapped our little charade and then I followed the captain back to our speeder answered a few impromptu questions from reporters with the hollow feeds before we got in. It must be a real honor telling these children what a difference they can make in the Empire. Yeah, a real honor. As soon as we closed the speeder door, Minnie took a deep breath and sighed. I'm sorry about that, Solomon. That was the worst of it, rest assured. No more mugging for the camera or anything like that. We just needed to get it out of the way for the brass and the core systems. I'm sure you can appreciate it. She pulled out a tobacco stick and lit it before handing me the package and her lighter. From here on, you're going to be meeting with fresh recruits and a few key civilians from the hollow feeds, but we'll ensure everything's easygoing and we have full editorial control of anything they capture. I shrugged it off, telling her it wasn't such a big deal. I was just glad to be in a place that didn't have me sweating through my shirt by lunchtime. And not having to wear IRDs? Who could complain? She laughed and opened the fridge, moving some bottles and pulled out some Merazine gold. Same size bottle we'd get our Kang tree in, but it was a completely different color. Kang tree was dark green. This stuff almost glowed. Merazine gold, the good stuff. She handed it over. You did great today. The Commodore is going to be very happy. She dropped me off at the barracks and told me they'd be by to pick me up just after 0800 the following morning, right when the fight broadcast would be starting up on the hollows. Tomorrow was going to be a wild day. Our barracks was interesting because normally a building like this would house an entire platoon. But there were only 18 of us, the 13 fighters, the skip, the three alternates in case we caught any injuries, and me. The room that normally would have been taken up with bunks and lockers was cleared for two long tables with seats at either side. Our food was brought to us and we ate alone as a team, which was smarter and safer than having a few hundred fighters at each other's throats standing in line together. Pusto walked past on his way to the showers. Well, look at fancy Boba Big Wheels over here. I could shave using that chest plate and a bottle of Merazine Gold. When I win the tournament, I'll have to buy me one of those. I put the bottle to my lips and swallowed a mouthful, then replied, you should, it's good stuff. I offered the bottle, given this was the friendliest I'd ever seen him. He laughed and waved it away. I'll take your word for it. No drink until I win this thing. The discipline on display here. Impressive. I stripped down, taking care to hang my uniform as meticulously as possible. Didn't want to throw any curveballs when heading out the next day. Then took note of what everyone else was wearing. Standard compression gear. What we wore as a base layer under our fatigues. Honestly, I wanted to fit in with them as best I could. I was already the outsider here. Best to do everything I could to assimilate with the team. 
We were milling around the room chatting with each other, waiting for dinner, which was due at any minute. I was still a bit woozy, drinking hard liquor on an empty stomach. I was out of sorts, on the outside, with nothing to offer to the conversation, and I didn't like it. The mess crew rolled in with a grav cart loaded with food. It smelled great. And they got to setting the tables. Raw recruits. This probably counted as part of their training. We were grabbing our spots before they'd even finished. Meal trays stacked high, and even more left on the cart. No one touched the food until the skip gave us the okay. As casual as things were, an essential loss of all rank and a reduction to fighter and coach, we still waited for her signal. That was non-negotiable. She wasn't even paying attention, just laying on her bunk with a data pad, reading. Then without looking up... What are you waiting for? Load up. We came at that meal like vamp slugs, tearing into it with a frenzied hunger. Slowly, chew your food. Eat at pace, give your bodies time to process. I don't want anyone screwing with their digestion. She was getting up now, heading towards the table, but stopped short and began explaining the rules of the tournament to us. It was a standard affair, just a bit larger scale than most. There were 832 fighters from across the 934th Legion. And the next day, everyone would be in the ring. 416 fights in venues all over the city. Some of them in plazas, some of them in gymnasiums, storage lots, rooftops, all over an eight by eight meter square. Three three minute rounds. You stepped out of bounds, got thrown out of bounds, you lost the round. You won a fight by winning two of three rounds, submitting your opponent or knocking them out. Very simple, very quick. You lose one fight and that was it. First day, you fought once. Second day, twice. Third day, you would fight three times. And what made the third day so pivotal is that the fighter with the fastest victory got a pass through the fourth day and advanced directly to the semifinal rounds on day five. It was a grueling schedule. Injuries were common at events like this, which is why each team had three alternates. But the wrench the brass had thrown in, one intended to show the iron resolve of the 934th Iron Star, was that no alternates would be allowed after the third day. This little rule definitely added an element of strategy, but it also ensured no one threw in a fresh fighter on the final day to stack the fights. Everyone in the ring on day five would be battered, bruised, and putting on a display of endurance. That means you gotta finish quick, kids. Get in, put them down. No dancing. Hefspar had a different take. But that also means your opponent will be trying to do the same. Let them come, carve your defense from stone, let them expose themselves, and punish them for it. Man, she scared me. The way she turned predator like that. I'd seen her put down a poda ape with her fists. Felt bad for anyone getting in the ring with her. This is nice. Before the final rounds of fights, Corporal Kwai will be given his order of Palpatine medal as part of the opening ceremony. I didn't need to set an alarm the next morning, just got up with everyone else. They were loud, boisterous, shouting and jostling each other, talking strategy, shadow boxing, practicing holds and chirping each other relentlessly. People getting slammed into lockers, everyone dropping critiques. Chants of 20, 20, 20, 20, which was our company, if you'll remember. 
As tense as the day was sure to be, everyone was in great spirits. The fights would be broadcast through a singular channel, a multi-feed band on the Holonet. The entire Legion would be studying and dissecting every matchup, everyone posting their own analysis, messages of encouragement, and imperial tons of shit talk. And it wasn't just our Legion that was obsessing. The 30780 and the 11416 were paying close attention too. Even saw some chatter from the inner systems and along the ring. We were reading the chatter on the open boards, rumors of organizing an even bigger tournament the following year with all three legions. But for now, most of what was being said was about who would win this one. The common line of thought was that the troopers who'd been in Seston 4 since the beginning were of much harder stock than those who began their tour in the nebula. I wanted to post my own takes, but the skip told me not to. It was the only direct order she gave that entire week. Speeders began arriving at 0700, picking up fighters and ferrying them to their destinations. Murray wasn't fighting until just after lunch, and he was practicing holds with Sergeant Hefspar when I left. <laughs> He was actually holding his own against her, too. Strength against strength, which was impressive. And I made a mental note of it. If I was ever in another bar brawl, stick close to the Atoan. I nodded to them as I went out to meet my ride. It was funny seeing all these fleet speeders pick up random mutters from up and down the line of barracks and then my pristine serif rolling in, turning all the heads. I already stood out given I was the only one in uniform. Everyone else was wearing compression gear. That's the thing with Terakasi. Clothing is optional. The fighters wear as little as possible, some nothing at all. And here I was, in brand new custom-made fatigues. I was walking Peacock out there. Good morning, Solomon. You ready for your big day? I nodded and stepped into the speeder. She handed me a decanter of bean coffee and commented that we need to give my armor a polish. Today would be interviews and photo shoots. We pulled into one of the speeder pools, a bigger hangar with walkers everywhere. They had those floating hollow cams circling with a collection of atmospheric projectors. Techs were lining stuff up, hitting buttons on consoles and making random cinematic backdrops appear. A starscape, a jungle, a marsh, a hangar filled with sabers and walkers. Which made me chuckle. Why not just use the hangar we were in? They kept at it while Captain Minnie explained the nuts and bolts of the day. We want to get your face all over, Solomon. Less than a hundred troopers have won the Order of Palpatine. It's a big deal. Things like this are a huge help when recruiting from smaller systems. Give those kids the idea that they too can rise up and become a hero for the Empire. She held this stare, framed in a smile, like I was supposed to cheer or something. Instead, my head just went up and down and I took a sip from the bean coffee. The morning was spent having me assume various poses, changing uniforms, putting on dirtied up fatigues, holding up different weapons, rolling on the ground, which was cool, actually. The projectors made it look like I was in wet mud and it splashed when I moved, which really did a number on my brain. You expect it to be wet and cold, but it's not. There's nothing there. After taking some pictures of me disassembling a blaster and reassembling it while pretending to study every piece with genuine curiosity, Captain Minnie ordered the shoot to stop. Okay, that's enough. We have everything we need. We'll do the candid street stuff this afternoon. But for now, we gotta get him to the fight on Hangar 16's roof. She looked at me deadpan. The Atoan? Private Murray? He's your friend, right? I agreed and spent a minute extolling the virtues of our illustrious comms tech. 
She raised her eyebrows with pure apathy and then looked back at the crew. The west side cargo port in Floon Bay. Flat top on 16. Let's go. We didn't go back to the speeder. Instead, we went outside and there was a small transport shuttle. The kind repair crews use when doing spot checks on docked cruisers. With all the gear, we just fit. We zipped over the tarmac and I could see multiple spots with fights taking place. They had these things happening all over the city, over 400 fights in a single day. And no matter where you were in Floon Bay, there was one close by. Bedding parlors were doing brisk business. Many even told me there were more than a million visitors from across the local star cluster taking in the action, including some VIP trade partners of the Empire, some of whom I'd be meeting later that night. But for now, I was told to just enjoy the show. We came in over top an expansive trade port, a lot of landing pads for larger caliber ships, interstellar craft, and dozens more for mid-sized frigates and cargo haulers. Our shuttle was heading for one of the major hangars. It was big enough for an Arkenton's class cruiser, like the ones we had patrolling the local system. There were two rings set up on the roof and stands built around them. It was a wild view from up here. Saw the whole skyline and out passed into the bay. The seating was set up in a way so the rings were near the edge of the hangars, but not close enough that a fighter stood much of a chance of going off the side. But there was no seating between the ring and the edge. Gave everyone in the stands an incredible vantage point. The fight below you, the expanse of the city behind. A masterclass in visual planning. Our shuttle was the only one up there, and it was kept clear by some buckets. Everyone coming in had to take the service lift, go through the whole thing on foot, take it all in, marvel at the pomp of the empire, which was the idea. And the best part, most of our company's fights were up here. The 20th was in the spotlight. Minnie gave me leave to find my people, my people. She said the brass wanted footage of me cheering on with my comrades. The drone camera zipped out and flew across the stands. There were dozens of other cameras for sure. Countless hollow feeds taking it in. Little pods zipping one way or another to ensure anyone watching the feed had a seamless holographic connection. I worked my way through the crowd and picked out Hef's bar. She always stood out. More so this time as she was heading towards the ring with the skip. That was where I needed to be. No one in that mess of people gave a shit about me though. I was just some other mutter trying to get close. I didn't know if I was even gonna get to the ring before the bell rang, but a stormtrooper saw me and dragged me through the crowd shoving people one way or another. They bounced off him like flotsam on a ship's hull. This guy was massive too. The kind of trooper you deployed in a crowd just to terrify everyone into obeying. Our company was clustered all in the front row, a roped off section for anyone stepping into the ring. Prime seating. Enjoy the fights, bro. I was sweating. The sun beamed down hard and the nebula glowed a faded mauve in the daylight sky. I wiped my brow and headed for the bleachers. The only spot was next to Husto. Murray was on the opposite side and gave me a nod. He was focused though, no smile. His knee bouncing, looked more tense than he did on a flyout. This is gonna be a good one, Kwai. The corporal wasn't even looking at me. Hefspar had a shitty draw, look what she's fighting. I glanced up, taking the actual ring in for the first time. Lined up across from her was a stacked Twi'lek male, deep purple, with these burning yellow eyes. He bore his teeth, jagged, pointed. I watched this guy practice. He's from the 11th company. He's a lot faster than her and he's strong too. 
He's gonna come in hot and punish her. Just wait. The bell rang and both fighters came out of the corner. F-Spar was shuffling, feet apart, solid base. And just as our asshole medic predicted, this guy came in on fire. At a near sprint, leaping into the air and dropping a massive flying kick. The sergeant stepped back, but her left side exposed, and the Twilix slammed a spinning elbow into her lower back. Gusto wasn't lying. He was really fast. His bulk betrayed him, and he was unrelenting. Hefspar had a solid defense, but was fighting on her heels, giving ground. She wasn't getting boxed in, though. Her footwork was solid, and at no point in the first round did her opponent manage to cut off the corner. And every time she hit him, it was big. She had the edge on power, but he was too quick for her combinations to catch. Twos and threes, even those were finishing indirectly, and the purple bastard would slip out of the way. Near the end of the first round, he caught her clean, and she was almost turtle for the last 15 seconds. No offense, just shifting side to side, blocking, holding him off. The bell rang, and she came back to the corner, breathing heavy, it was favoring her right leg, slapping her left and looking beside me at Husto. He nodded to her with a smile, and she grinned back with bloody teeth. It's too bad you can't place bets, because anyone with money off Hefspar is about to cash their chips. The skip and our Deveronian sergeant exchanged some words in the corner. It was too loud to make anything out. The pace was frantic. Then the bell rang again. Hefspar loped out into the center of the ring. She was leaning in, slow, stalking, and predatory. And again, that Twilik came out quick. He whipped a few front kicks, and the sergeant just batted them away. These were more strikes than blocks. Her arms slamming down hard against the side of his shin. They exchanged for a bit. Hespar was backing up, wincing, and the Twilik smelled blood. He leaned in on his strikes. Hespar blocked and moved in like lightning, closing the gap. She threw three very quick punches. Two jabs and stepping close in for a tight right hook. It connected clean. You felt it from the stands. Following the momentum from the hook, she snapped her right leg in a low whip kick that smashed into the side of her opponent's left knee. I watched it crumple, implode in slow motion. Then she connected with a thunderous left uppercut as the guy from the 11th collapsed. The shot lifted him clean for a second. He was airborne, certified. Guy was a brick when he hit the mat. Hefspar turned for the corner like it was just another day at the office. Cold as ice. Hopped into the ring and took her seat among the team. The skip shouted down to Murray. I looked over and saw he was already standing, taking off his PT jacket. I had to go over. I got the impression this was something Minnie wanted, so whatever. I pretended it was some big moment for me, too. And I knew when I told Murray about it, he'd laugh. I came in close, and he looked confused. What the shit are you doing? I said I needed to hug him. It was for the hollow reel the brass were making. If this makes the cut, you owe me royalties or something, Kwai. I'm a professional. I don't work for free. Then he flipped me off as he headed for the ring. I came back to my seat. And Husto didn't even look over, focused on the fights, like a baker watching his pastries. Murray's opponent was stepping into the ring from the other side, a light-skinned human male, or rather looked human, who knows? I thought Murray was human for the first two weeks on the crossfire. Murray should win this one pretty easy. Just needs to keep his distance. Look at that guy's shoulders. He grapples. Probably a lot of elbows and locks and shit. I asked the medic when he was fighting. I was up already. The second heat, a merry lot. A lean one. She threw too many kicks, so I took her out a minute into the opening round. 
Like I said last night, gotta end these things quick. Save the juice. Typical. I was hoping he'd have been paired up with some hot shit Mando and gotten work, but no such luck. The bell rang and Murray's fight was on. He came up a lot faster than Hefspar. It was his opponent that moved slow. And just like Husto predicted, the human threw a few soft punches and moved in to grapple. It was a beautiful takedown too. Sent Murray flailing hard onto the mat. I wondered if he was out cold, but no. That Atoan circulatory system kept him conscious. His opponent was trying to get Murray's head in a lock with his legs. Use those big muscles in the thigh to choke him out. But Murray was strong, very strong. He pushed one arm through the locked legs and gripped the human's arm. Then somehow, and I couldn't make it out entirely, I didn't have the right angle, he got to his feet, swung the human up like a weight. This pale shithead was still hanging on. Then Murray smashed him into the ground like he was a half full Duraweave sandbag. The guy lost his grip and spilled onto the mat, laid there like a prone bug waiting to get squished. Murray hesitated, not knowing if this was a trap. Then he stutter stepped in to end it, but the ref pulled him back. It was over. The human was out. They needed some medics to pull him off the canvas. Murray waved to the crowd, arms high, and cheered for himself. The opposite of Hefspar. He loved it. Soaked in the attention. I was cheering too. No decorum. Who cared? Murray came down from the ring and ran over to me. He was really over the top. Really playing it up for the cameras. Then he came in for a big hug and pulled my face into his armpit. That's for you, buddy. Well played, Murray. They better keep that in there. I'm hilarious. The next fight was just beginning. No one from the 20th up in there. Just some rub dudes I'd never seen before. Didn't know them. And they were in no spot to put money in my pocket, so who cared? My bracelet lit red. A message from Minnie. Return to the shuttle, Corporal. They really got you on a leash, pal. Go have fun with the white tunics. White tunics. Nothing but stress. I pushed my way through the crowd, which was like going upstream. No one was trying to leave except me. The shuttle was easy to find as it was the only shuttle there. The captain and the crew were gathering up their things, including the camera drones and the like, loading gear back in like it was all routine. Sure, they were filming this stuff, but were they taking it in? I asked what the plan was now. Just a few casual shots, nothing big. But we gotta get you fitted for dress before dinner. There's the opening gala with VIPs. Commodore wants you there to shake hands. Apparently, I would be staying in a private suite that night, not even going back to my barracks. I could already hear the shit talk from the rest of the squad. They were gonna let me have it when I got back to the hotel. Were I in their spot, I sure would. What are we to think of this Captain Mini? How long will Murray last in the ring? And what about the rest of the 20th Company? Will they take home the title and a hefty stack of creds? That's next time on Episode 24, A Certain Type of Honesty. Thank you for joining me this week on Fearless Fred Presents Mud 79, a Star Wars fan fiction podcast. If you haven't already, make sure you follow the show so you'll never miss an episode. While you're there, don't forget to rate and review us. It helps grow the show and will make my contemptible harpy of a producer very happy. We're available for free at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music, and wherever else you get your favorite streaming audio. You can also listen at CuriousCast.ca. Be sure to check out the show notes for more information and a full listing of Mud79's cast. 
If you want to reach out to me directly, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at fearless underscore Fred or email me at mud79 at curiouscast.ca. This show is hosted and written by me, Fred Kennedy, and Dila Velasquez, the Harpy, our producer. Sound design is by moi, and final production is by Rob Johnson. I'll see you next week for more Mud 79.